This topic is so important to the world and to our own existence. And we, yes, us, all of us humans, almost destroyed our bee population. And not only the bees, but to the birds and the butterflies for using insecticides. And I know that uh, Shannon, you've been at many of those meetings that we learned a lot about that. And I personally um, was helped along the way to understand just what was going on and, and um, the importance of planting all different plants and bushes in, in our gardens. And so I have done my part to do that. And I get to see all of our little pollinators come at every, they start in the summer and they last straight through to the, to the fall. And I, and I really enjoy, and not just enjoy, seeing them, but also to know that we're doing a diff making a little bit of a difference in our, in our world. And so, the, um, so when, when we think of all, the, all, of this, all of what we do on a daily basis, um, and if it's just meaning that we can plant something or do some, some little things in our garden, which is also very calming and, and very meditative, um, I think that that's, that's a great thing. And I, I'm just so looking forward to hearing so much more about it. And, um, before we get to enjoy what all the buzz is about, I'd like to um, have everyone put their hands together and be, have, give a big applause, um, a, a very, very big thank you and help me to say thank you to our presenters and to our hosts. So can we have a round of applause for them? Yeah, so we have lots of, yay. So. Um, again, I want to say thank you uh, again to the staff um, for helping for our committee and to Shannon. And so I hope that every one of you enjoys this evening's webinar and it'll be good. I'd like to send it back to our planner, Amy Powell. Enjoy your evening, everyone. Thank you very much, um, Madam Mayor, for those excellent opening remarks. Um, and thank you to everyone that's here with us this evening um, to participate virtually on Shannon's uh, what's sure to be an excellent delivery of her webinar. Uh, so tonight we're going to learn about native plants to help attract pollinators to your own garden or farm. We're also going to discover some of the many pollinators that you can attract, find out how to prepare your site to start a new garden, and tips for lower maintenance. There will be plenty of times for questions. What I would ask is that if you do have a question, if you could input it into the chat function on Zoom, and then um, Elizabeth and myself will be managing the questions that do come before us, uh, just so we can ensure everyone's questions are provided uh, to Shannon um, in a timely fashion and in an organized fashion. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Shannon Stevens from the NBCA. She is their Healthy Waters Program Coordinator. Shannon has been with the NBCA since 2006, working with landowners on projects to improve water quality and restore habitat. Over 25 years of experience with ecological restoration of wetland, prairie, river, and woodlands. Shannon also has experience with plot, plant propagation, planting experience, and conservation, conservation lands management with the Royal Botanical Gardens. She's skilled in plant identification, seed collection, germination, and dormancy research, and invasive species control, uh, as well as Coots Paradise wetland restoration and volunteer coordination with the Bay Area Restoration Council and Hamilton Harbor Remedial Action Plan. So we welcome you, Shannon, and we look forward to a great presentation this evening. Thank you again to everyone for attending, and I'll be looking out for the comments in the chat function. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Amy, and I uh, so appreciate you guys inviting me here today. If you just uh, hold tight while I share my screen. And if I can just get a thumbs up uh, from you, Sandy, you're kind of next to me in the video that you can see it. Okay, beautiful. Um, just want to say, so I'm so happy to see everyone out tonight. Um, really enjoy uh, sharing kind of my love of the natural world. And I've been lucky to land in a job that lets me do that with people that are really keen on trying to give a little bit back. And this is one of the ways you can do that with pollinators particularly in mind. Um, so without further ado, uh, get into how you can attract pollinators uh, to your home or your township. Uh, we'll have lots of different options depending, and there's no right answer. 
everybody's in their own journey. So really want to emphasize, you know, there's no judgment here. Take what you can out of this presentation. Emerson said the earth laughs in flowers. Um, and you, you may have the same excitement that my friend Katu has here when visiting an exciting flower patch. Um, but it's, it's, and there's something about it that just grabs us. So what I want to do though, is get you to think a little bit like a biologist because they're no question beautiful, but there's a secret life happening here. There's lots of hidden markings, there's scents, some of them that smell like insect pheromones. And if you can keep all those interesting stories in mind, you, you might see some of the intriguing things happening around flowers and uh, using, using them to get to attract pollinators to your garden. Now it's easy to forget when you're faced with the beauty of a flower that really what you're looking at is the sexual part of a plant. And the plant here, and this is gonna take you way back to biology, we've got the inside of a plant, might be a tool up there on the right. So you see the female part, the stigma, where the pollen's gotta to get to, and the male parts, the anthers with the pollen stuck to it. And really it's all about for the plant, how, do, how can I have sex when I can't move? And so a lot of this pollination is really all about trying to exchange those genes. And if it's successful, then the plant, um, and you see on the right here, an old, um, looks like a daffodil or something that's been fertilized and it's, the seeds are starting to swell. Now, if, if you can't move, you gotta find something to do the moving for you. So wind is an option. So you'll see a lot of the grasses and the grain crops like corn and, and oats and things that are wind pollinated. And there's certain things that make those flowers um, kind of function. They tend to make lots of light airy pollen. And if you suffer from uh, pollen allergies, uh, you can blame these guys. Uh, but one of the things is people hardly think of these as flowers because they're so nondescript. Ragweed's kind of a classic case where the flowers are small and the green and they're not really trying to attract anything because wind doesn't ask all that much of you in return. However, if you're what you think of as a classical flower, you gotta grease the wheels a bit here. <laughs> so how they do that is both with pollen that's got some great nutrient values and proteins and oils, and, and then the nectar that's basically sugar water with different types of sugars in it. And how much the plant is willing to bribe the pollinator is actually incredible because if you think of honeybees, the plant, they're basically in Canada, it's about 80 million pounds of honey. And honeybees are just one of the many pollinators out there. Now, if you think of this, make it closer to home about what's actually going on here. The honeybee is collecting all this and it's creating food for its hive. We're taking a little bit off the top if we keep a hive, but one pound of honey, if you think of a jar of honey in your cupboard, what actually goes into that? And so each bee over its lifetime collects maybe a teaspoon and a bit of honey. And to get enough of those bees all together, working together to bring it back to the hive, you're talking about 2 million flower visits that happen here. And on average might be about 80,000 kilometers. So that's like going around the earth twice to make that single pound of honey you've got in your cupboard. So you're talking about a lot, a very successful bribe from the plant's point of view to get that happening, you've got all these flower visits that are happening. And again, this is just one species. Now that's incredibly important to agriculture and the things we love to eat. Um, so in, Can in Ontario, we've got about 3000 beekeepers that are registered, 100,000 hives. Um, and they create almost close to a billion dollars of agricultural crop sales. And particularly the bumblebees uh, within greenhouses are very important there too. And bumblebees are kind of a nice 
to manage population in greenhouses because they don't get lost. They're good at navigating through the greenhouses, which are trickier for other bees. So you talk honeybees and bumblebees, and when you ask people, that's often what they first comes to mind for pollinators. Important for your own garden, if you're a vegetable garden like me, bringing in and all of the tomatoes and the squash before the first hard frost. But there are a lot of other beautiful pollinators out there. Um, so here we've got the honeybee, of course, but then you've also got a bunch of native bumblebees. There are lots of flies that are pollinators. We've got a single hummingbird up in, up in Ontario, the ruby-throated hummingbird. Lots of um, butterflies and moths like to land and sip the nectar on flowers. Um, as well, you get beetles. I think we've got like a soldier beetle there. Even wasps, which people don't classically think of as being good pollinators, are actually quite important. And there's particularly a lot of orchids around the world that they're very specialized to specific species of wasp. Uh, skip down, we've got the, the hummingbird uh, moth over at the bottom with the queerings. And I'm going to talk just a tiny little bit about the story. If on the bottom middle, what you see there is the squash, the hoary squash bee. Um, and this is a specialist bee where it's really evolved um, First Nations corn bean squash, the three sisters. So squash has been in kind of agricultural production here since pre-colonization. And this bee has evolved particularly to fertilize pumpkins and zucchinis and squash. And what it will do is the male of the species is no fool. He is going to where the females are going to come. So he doesn't need the pollen, but he'll nip over to the squash and kind of lurk around waiting for the females to come by. And then basically they will do their business together. Uh, she'll get, she'll be fertilized, but she'll have all in visiting this, she'll have fertilized many squash plants. Now the bee, male bee thinks, oh, well, I want to have a nice safe spot. So overnight as the, so in, in the morning squash blooms open up, but then as the heat of the day, as they fertilize, they wither down. Um, and this male squash bee will hang out inside there overnight as a nice safe place to hang out. And then in the morning, he will eat his way out through the petal, doesn't hurt the fruit production at all, and move on to the next uh, just opening squash blossom that's coming out. So just like one of the many stories that's kind of happening in the garden. And if you actually take those withered squash blossoms and just tap them, you might actually hear some hoary bees within there um, in your own garden. They can't sting you, so you don't need to worry about that. Now, on the tricky part, like so many species, uh, we are running into some pressures that are putting these species at risk and in decline. Uh, the rusty patch bumblebee and bumblebees in general used to be very common, and now the rusty patch one is basically almost extirpated. Very few sightings in the last decade uh, in Ontario, if any. Um, so things that are putting that pressure in is we're converting the landscape into urban areas. We're planting it with things that have kind of minimum value around lawns or putting concrete over it. Um, you know, in agriculture, you can have a certain amount of intensification that gets rid of some key habitats. And some of the pesticides that we use um, can be harmful. So things like integrated pest management uh, that you can do either at your in the home level or in the farm level is really important. And it's important not just to protect those bees, but it's also important in the same way not misusing antibiotics is important because for those things to work at all, um, the species can't adapt to them. So you don't want your pest species to get all adapted to the tools that you have in your toolbox. I know in the gardens, when I worked for the RBG and the Royal Botanical Gardens, um, their pest manager had actually moved all of the greenhouses in the gardens over to biocontrols and had eliminated the need um, for using chemical pesticides. Other things you can do that are very helpful is if you have a yard that has some natural areas or field edges, help protect those things. Um, and if you can, leave them undisturbed. It's really a question of protecting what you have. And then enhancing that or even creating some new habitats. And we're going to get into that 
uh, in the rest of this. Now, people are probably coming from all scales. And the nice thing is, is pollinators can really work at all scales. Even if you have an apartment with a balcony, you can put in a number of plants, whether it's tomato plants with some flowers, try to plant things that are blooming through the year at that very small scale, whether it's an urban garden or a country garden. And there's different methods that will get into how to create some of those gardens. Even a lawn can be made a little more bee friendly. Um, so we'll talk about that a bit, how to do pollinator patches, larger scale restoration uh, that's getting into like the acres mark. And if you are in a condo or you just love gardening and aren't getting your fix at home, you can approach the township like Essa Township is doing and create a community pollinator garden. So, and help with some of the natural plantings. And we get a lot of volunteers through the years doing a lot of tree plantings and other restoration types. Um, so if you're interested and in, are in the Nottawasaga watershed, you can always drop me your email and I will be happy to add you to our volunteer list if you're not on there already. There's also the ability to convert things like roadsides and utility corridors and plant them up for pollinators. And on the farm, there's lots of different ways. And this can be a benefit to the crop as well as a benefit to things like erosion control. There's a lot of multiple benefits that come in this, um, both for pollinators as well as like getting projects that give you the best bang for the buck on multiple fronts. So when you're thinking about doing any kind of planting, there's some key components you need to consider. One is water, the other is where are you planting? What's your site like? What's the soil? Any kind of fertilizer or nutrient value that's there? Thinking about what is your hope? Are you planting for certain types of plants and animals that you're hoping to get? And you really do need to consider people too. How are people interacting with this environment? And I'm going to talk about people first of all, because a lot of people are nervous about bringing pollinators into the garden because they're worried about getting stung. And it's really worth knowing that of the 400 or so native bees that we have, about 300 of them are really important for pollination. Um, most of them are solitary. A lot of them are very non-aggressive. They don't live in hives and a lot of them can't even sting you, let alone all the other thousands of pollinators from ants to beetles to that. So, and some precautions you can take, um, like wearing shoes. <laughs> if you are doing these things. So a little precaution goes a long way and just being mindful. Um, but it is, you got to remember too that the bee does not want to sting you. Um, the, like a honeybee's bar breaks off and it basically is a death sentence. It's doing it to protect the hive. And it's, um, it's interesting because if you think of this, it's kind of at the scale of like, the bee is like, imagine you and like something the size of an apartment building and or Godzilla, <laughs> but yet it's Godzilla that's really nervous about this little bee. <laughs> so if you can just be a little mindful, um, we can all kind of work together on that. Um, but it is a great place of discovery too. Um, let's see, other key things. So again, think what you would need. You need, if you're going to attract pollinators, you need water, food, and shelter. So something as simple as providing safe water sources by adding a few stones into the bird bath so that you're not creating a drowning hazard, but something that the bees can, bees and butterflies can land on safely and skim the water off where it's nice and shallow. Um, it's also important to know that beyond food and pollen, which are definitely food sources for these pollinators, they also might need to eat some of the host plants or they might need to use some of the materials to create their nests. And you've got this leaf cutter bee that's taken some snacks, well, not snacks, building materials out of this rose bush. And they're using that to create their, their nest. And um, so when you look at the garden, instead of seeing a plant that's got holes in it as a sign of failure or that you must do something, intentionally plant those host plants to provide 
those building materials or those calories for caterpillars and things. And so see that as a success of your garden working instead of something to panic about. Um, the next thing is shelter. So most of the ground bees, about two thirds, are ground nesting bees. Um, and again, they're solitary. So they'll make these tunnels that might go down half a meter with little spurs off of them. And when they collect the pollen, they bring it back and they lay their egg with a little pollen sack near it so that it has something to eat when it hatches. And again, the vast majority of those native bees, it's, it's just one bee. Uh, they also like to nest in hollow stems. So as you see here, someone's created a little bit of bamboo, hollow bamboo as an extra habitat structure, but you can do that naturally by leaving the hollow grasses through the winter and into kind of the warmer part of the spring before you clean it up. Again, bee type personalities tend to do the best at doing this. <laughs> so if you're an A type personality, you just gotta reframe it that leaving some of those things that you might think are messy right now is actually a sign of success that you're you're growing your your pollinators because as they as they get through the winter and they've gone through that kind of torpor period either as an adult or as a pupating sort of larva they need the weather to be warm for about yeah it could take a while a few weeks when it's above say 10 degrees consistently before they start to hatch out. So if you collect all that and put it in a yard waste bag and ship it off to the composting site, then you've composted a lot of your native pollinators. Um, so in, other things you can do is actually put it um, in a brush pile on your own property, uh, keep your pollinators kind of in place. And bees are really interesting in what they'll use. We even have a bee, one of the Osmia ones, that actually would use old snail shells to lay their eggs in. So just the diversity of life out there is quite incredible. Uh, see here, one of the honeybees sipping some water. Other things you want to do is if you can add water features that have some mud in them, you'll attract things like the male butterflies that like to puddle. This sort of gathering is called puddling and they're gathering minerals and salts. And they include that in their sperm packet when they mate with the females so that it can help nurture their young. And it can be beautiful. Uh, you've got trumpet vines around this home, whole bunch of different things attracting pollinators and visually quite aesthetically appealing too. And getting plants that bloom in all seasons is very important. If you are using mulch, uh, and you'll notice some of these gardens uh, do, very important to have spots where you brushed away the mulch because remember that ground access for ground nesting bees, which is a lot of the native bees, is what they like. So just in around the edges, make some nice areas. The other good thing you can do here is you see the sedums, the nice pink flowers all planted together, is that don't make the bees travel more than they have to. They're already traveling extraordinary distances. Remember that 80,000 kilometers for a pound of honey. Try to make a good food resource that's nutrient dense altogether. And again, leaving some of those, those leaves and things, the bumblebees might be hibernating under um, and stems that you'll have nice eggs and things. You'll also that way maintain a lot of your beneficial insects. I was rooting around the garden and finding praying mantis egg casings. You can also turn a lawn into something that's a lot more bee friendly by planting small spring bulbs. Um, you'll notice in Canada, a lot of the early spring flowers are actually willow trees and poplars. And the rest of them are actually in the woods. You get those springtime ephemerals like the trilliums and spring beauties and trout lilies. But in the open areas, there's not a lot. So doing this can provide some early pollen. And find your inner child again. Let your dandelions bloom. They do actually great things around soil aeration as well because they can have roots at a foot or two deep, but they can go as deep as 10 feet down. And with some of the impacted soils around urban areas particularly, aerating to those deeper profiles is actually bringing up some great nutrients. Other things you can do is if you don't want to pay for fertilizer again, you can overseed with Dutch white clover. It also fixes nitrogen in as well as providing nice pollen sources. Overseeding with some, some creeping thyme, heal all. It works best if you can aerate the lawn uh, just to create some more spaces 
uh, where the seeds can get established. Violets work well if you've got a bit of a shady area. And again, just set your mower a little higher and all of a sudden you'll have created something that really doesn't attract very much into something that's buzzing with excitement. And I always, there is room for lawns. I am not one of those ecologists that thinks, oh, lawns are terrible. Over septic systems, they're just brilliant. Although there are some septic safe mixes for flowers. But I tend to think of a lawn as something like an area rug that highlight maybe accentuates the gardens instead of wall to wall carpeting. Um, other things you can get involved with, this is a pollinator garden over in Mono Township near Orangeville. A great way to meet people of similar minds, learn a lot. And it's also very important in kind of creating that green space for all, no matter where you're living, if you don't have access to it because you live, say, in a small apartment or condo. If you're on a farm, uh, this is, I get a lot of uh, calls from rural and farm landowners and depending on what their interest is, the first thing I love to do is pull up the air photos. The counties have great ones. And we, we talk about where the possibility for those habitats. So it might be adding a tree planting a fence row and under seeding it with some pollinator seed mix, creating a warm season hay field that can be harvested kind of in the late summer that's got some forbs or wildflowers in it, creating a designated sort of pollinator patch where you're intentionally creating uh, flowers, a flower rich area might be near your beehives. Um, if you're adding uh, a wetland that can create some nice attractiveness and the berms of both the wetlands and if you're doing a water and sediment erosion control, which is the wasp cob, all need to be planted with something permanent. So adding some flowers into that mix uh, can do double duty. Now, if you're going at a smaller scale, um, you can do dig. We won't talk about digging. Um, I've done a lot of it in my life and I prefer the no digging. <laughs> Uh, so this is kind of a lasagna style garden. There are much more complicated versions of this with woody materials and many, many layers, kind of like lasagnas themselves. This is a simple lasagna. So you've got the ground, there might be lawn on it, you're going to mow it, you're going to add cardboard and newspaper layers, and on top of that you're going to add about 10 inches to a foot of soil. You may want to add a little bit of a layer of compost there, especially if you're using a wood chippy mulch that's going to lock up some of the nitrogen. On the happy side, a lot of native plants don't like a lot of nitrogen. They actually compete a little bit better with some of the weeds if it's low. Um, so it's not that critical. But uh, if you're seeing you're getting a bit of yellowing, it might be nitrogen. Uh, so add a tiny bit of compost. The township provides some beautiful compost. Um, and when you're planting, just move aside the mulch in that specific area that you're planting in, exposing a little bit of soil beyond the planting area. Remember those ground nesting bees and the mulch will help uh, provide like moisture retention um, as well as like weed control. And consider, you know, adding a few extra areas of bare ground. Now, if you're working on a slightly bigger scale, although it doesn't have to be, you can do a technique called solarizing, where you're basically laying down a clear tarp. Uh, you can get this at Home Depot as a vapor barrier or in large, if you're doing a really large site, we have used um, greenhouse plastic rolls uh, to cover large areas. Again, you mow the area, you pin down it, six inch sod, sod staples work much better than like random rocks. Um, but make sure that that's tight down there because you don't want it blowing away. And you want to make sure that it's on from at least June to September. It can be on longer, you can get it on early in the season. And you can leave it on over winter if you want, if you want to do spring seeding, but you can also do fall. The heat gets very hot under there, over 50, 60 degrees easily. Um, and then this not only kills off the vegetation, but it takes down the weed seed bank too. Now you want to gently rake off any duff material because you don't want to expose deeper seed banks. And then you can seed or plant as you like. You might want to add a cover crop like annual rye just to keep the weed competition down. And so this is a nice technique if you've got an existing meadow habitat but you're wanting to add some extra diversity into it. Um, or if you want to turn part of your lawn into uh, a garden and you've got some time, 
especially if it's quite large and you don't want to get that much uh, soil delivered. And this is an example of one of the solarizing sites. Joanne Martin turned this, um, the hill slope there, you see it's about three years old. And some of the wildflowers are coming out well. You'll see where she's moved on to the next section uh, with the solarizing tarps down there. And this is what it looks like at about four years old. Um, and this went from basically a pure stand of cow vetch uh, that didn't it's, it can be a bit aggressive. It does have pollinator habitat, but it's a single species that was covering this site. So the solarizing was kind of the only way to go there. One of the other ways you can get there is chemical control. Um, in this particular farm, the farmer wanted to change from field crops over into a hay field and wanted to go with native tall grass. Um, so it was in corn and soybeans um, up until planting. And then in the spring, hired in a contractor to seed um, this area into a mix of grass and wildflowers. And uh, the nice thing with native tall grasses is the harvesting happens late in the summer because that's when they grow into the growth peak. And this is only year two. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about timelines later, but already the wildflowers are coming. A lot of the wildflowers have to go through cold stratification. So if you plant in the spring, you're only going to see the bulk of them come up in, in year two, just starting. Uh, another example is converting hydro corridors or roadsides um, into some pollinator habitat. And this is where municipalities can get involved. Um, this is down in Toronto where they created a 16 kilometer corridor of beautiful pollinator habitat with recreational opportunities along the trail. Um, and changing something that was a constant, you know, mowing multiple times a year, but not a lot of value into something that is just dramatically beautiful, um, as well as used by the community a lot. Um, this, to get the site preparation, was a whole amount of mowing and treating and plowing multiple times, leaving a cover crop on there in the middle to protect ground nesting birds like bobolink. Uh, the last treatment happened in September, and then it was seeded with a mixture of grasses and forbs, which are the wildflowers. And about 20 species went into this, um, and they did their seeding in the fall. And if you seed in the fall, then that cold stratification, that moist cold stratification, the wildflowers, a lot of them need. So they kind of, you'll get like a, a little bit of a jump on your wildflower maturity because they'll be ready to go by spring. Cost-wise, this is kind of what we're looking at. So if you're doing a seed mix, something really grass heavy will be on the cheaper end of this and something really wildflower heavy will be on the more expensive. And remember per hectare, you need about eight kilograms per hectare um, is kind of the target. So it can be fairly expensive if you're doing a very large area. For farmers and stuff, there, there's grants you can tap into to help you with some of those cost share costs. If you're doing bare root trees and shrubs, and it's important to remember um, that a lot of trees are host trees for a lot of caterpillars for butterflies and moss. Um, they're really part, important part of your pollinator plantings. Somerville sells them for about two bucks a tree. Uh, you get clusters of 10 and you have to order so many. So you might need to team up with your neighbors to order enough to meet their minimum orders. Um, Wildflower plugs are kind of very small sort of soil potted pugs and potted stock. If you're doing a big plant, it's important to order ahead of time and really recommend going with uh, native plant nurseries. We are seeing the beginnings of native plants coming into garden centers and things, which is very exciting. Uh, but if you're really trying to get local genetic stock um, and wild types and not cultivators, cultivars, sorry, um, the native plant nurseries tend to specialize in that. The cost is also slightly better because you're tending to buy smaller stuff from them. Seeding, you can seed by hand. Uh, you typically have to separate out your grass broadcasting from the flower mix. The flowers seeds, this is like planting gold. Like this is not a thing you want to send your kid or kindergarten kid out to do the wildflower part of this because you'll literally be holding hundreds of dollars in your hands and tens of thousands of seeds. So you want to mix that in with some kind of filler like sand before you broadcast it. 
and you want to grid yourself off so you can make sure that you're kind of doing a, a strip and not missing any of the areas. You can also hire a contractor to use something like a true axe prairie seeder that has three different boxes to make sure that all the different 20 something species you have in the mix are all getting applied at the right rates. So they, they have adjustable rate boxes there. Now, again, we talked a little bit about timelines. So if you're doing this, you really want to have realistic expectations. Again, that first year, don't freak out. <laughs> that is uh, what I will say is it may look a little weedy. You'll probably see mainly cover crop, but the flowers and, and the, um, and this is particularly for native grass and the flowers and the grasses are coming. They just are focusing on their roots. Second year, you'll start to see the early uh, wildflowers like the brown eyed Susans. In years three and four, you're really starting to see the grassland develop. And this is when, if you're using it as pasture or you're using it as late hay field, uh, if you're doing a tall grass prairie, that's when you start to be able to do the harvest. And keep in mind that unlike the European cool season grasses, this is hitting its stride kind of in late July, August. So it's great for ground nesting birds, great for pollinators because you're they've already, a lot of the flowers have bloomed and then you get pay for your horses or your cattle. If you are going to plant, highly recommend going native plants. Now, I'm not a purist. You may have a beautiful horticultural plants that you want to add in some native plants to. Um, but if you're trying to attract pollinators, there are a lot of benefits. First of all, they're gorgeous. Um, they're evolved to survive here and they'll attract a lot of insects and beneficial, whether they're pollinators or beneficial species like at Newman wasps. Um, and then they also good food for a lot of the wildlife that depends on them and the timing is right. And for me, one of the key things is, is I'm like a bit of a lazy gardener. I like to put my work in up front and then relax a little bit. <laughs> so once you get these guys established, there's some tweaking that will go on. You definitely need to think about the maintenance, but it's a lot less than some of the higher needier plants out there. Some of the plants might be things like the beautiful columbine that attracts hummingbirds, the butterfly milkweed that attracts things like monarchs, as well as a ton of other things that will go for the nectar, brown-eyed Susans, or the most beautiful Joe pieweed, which is likes to have a little bit and just will be a wash. Um, the one thing, oops. oh, there we go. Other reasons, and there's been a fair amount of research on this, is it not only uh, the native plants, because they evolve here, things evolve with them. So they will support 10 to 100 times more species on them. And some of the research around insect support, so this one was done uh, just on butterflies and moss, uh, looking both at abundance and the number of species. And both of those are significantly higher. So if you compare a native oak tree to something like a ginkgo, the native oak trees got 500 species of caterpillars. That's not coming out. <laughs> uh, whereas, whereas the ginkgo from Asia might only host five. Now remember, the ginkgo is native to Asia. So back in Asia, it's doing all sorts of great things. There's no evil plant. There's just plants that are kind of out of place. Um, there's, it also benefits specialists. Some plants have a single species of plant that they really need there to, to survive. So if you don't have that, you will not benefit from seeing that species around. And it's not just how many species, but the abundance of it. And so if you think of your plants as solar collectors and that energy that they're collecting from the sun and turning into sugars moving through the food chain, if you plant something that's not native to here, you're kind of creating a bottleneck in that system that trails through how many birds can survive and how much wildlife is there all, all the way up into the top predators. They're also got their timing right. So if you're having hatch out to say your bird nest things, bird fledglings that need to be fed and the caterpillars need to be there at a certain time, it helps that everything is kind of sequentially arranged is some of the problems climate change poses because that can throw that sequence out a little bit. 
if nothing else, you really should be a little bit aware of not introducing invasive exotic plants, which uh, a lot of the exotic stuff, like the Phragmites um, European version, the giant reeds that get away and destroy wetlands, have been brought in for horticultural reasons originally. There's a great guide called Grow Me Instead uh, that's available free, and it gives you suggestions for what might be a better option. Reasons you want to avoid that too are things like uh, dog strangling vine, which is an introduced species, can get away, suppress all kinds of natural systems, regeneration of forests and so on, but it's close enough related to milkweed that it attracts monarch butterflies to lay their eggs on it, but it's not close enough that the caterpillars can actually eat it and survive. So it just kind of creates this kind of death trap for those sorts of species. If you're thinking about plant additions, again, consider what your go when you go to the nursery, go with knowing what your soil is like. Is it dry or moist? How much sun? And kind of have you can have a short list kind of of things. I like to have a lot of perennials um, in there, but you can add in some annuals. Um, and make sure if you are going, you're bringing Latin names because there are a lot of common names that refer to different species. <laughs> so reduce the confusion. It's a pain in the rear end, but it is worth writing them out and bringing them with you. Um, if you're looking for native plant um, suppliers, we have a listing in the MVCA green pages of seed and plant suppliers for different habitat types. Um, if you are planting something from that's more of a horticultural cultivar, try to go for the single blooms. A lot of those double blooms come at the expense of the nectaries and pollen access. Um, and then there are cultivars that are designed like some of the sunflowers to be low or no pollen um, so that, you know, you're really reducing the food value for pollinators if you go off with some of those ones. Watering, if you're doing uh, some of these things, at least the first year, you're gonna need to water them to get them established a deep watering, you're aiming for about an inch a week, a little more if you're in an urban area because they're hotter and drier. Mulch can help with that. And I really love, particularly in urban environments, if, if your site is appropriate for it, going with the drought resistant plants, just because a lot of the soil profiles have often been a bit messed up during construction. And that's called xeriscaping. Um, there's some resources there and they can have insanely deep roots up to a couple stories deep. So things, and, uh, and you can see this in how drought resistant it's gonna be. So if you cast your eyes over uh, to the left there, you'll see kind of the average lawn root depth in the turf grass, maybe an inch or two. Whereas all these other plants that were evolved to deal with drought have these incredible deep root mass systems once you get them established. So once you get there, they're pretty good at, at uh, surviving through the droughts. And this is actually a very natural system. It was widespread, this tall grass prairie across Ontario from Windsor up to Owenda down to Rice Lake, Prince Edward County. But about 97, 98% of it's been lost and really you only have these tiny scattered remnants now. And it makes sense when farming developed, it was much easier to farm a prairie stand than cut down all the trees and do that. So you can see why some of it disappeared, but there are some beautiful um, benefits to restoring some of those species as well as keeping species at risk alive. So we're gonna get into tiny, how's the time going? Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> Okay, I want to give, I'll go a little few plants, um, but I do want to leave time for questions. One of the most overlooked plants is probably things like willows, which grow both, there's many species of willows in Ontario, from small shrubs up to quite large trees. But willows, when you have a warm patch, like we've just had in our spring, um, that pollen, the bees are coming out starving. And that pollen is one of the first food sources they can get their hands on. So other things like poplars and stuff are also good early spring feeds, but the willows are, are quite key. Um, there's even, most of them are wet foot lovers. 
but there's even an upland willow if you have a dry site you're trying to get a shrub willow for. Other spring bloomers are service berries. There's a number of species here but they flower nice and early. And then you have the additional bonus of having these fruits that are like tasting like things on there and the birds will love it as well as the pollinators. Uh, not as sexy, but I actually really love the grasses, um, but they are very important. Think of all of those one third of your native bees that are nesting in hollow stems and things. So having this really adds that shelter part. So adding in those native grasses, I think of this as like the skeleton of the garden, those trees and shrubs and grasses. And then you kind of highlight it with some of the showier companions, like different species of milkweed. We've got uh, butterfly weed, swamp milkweed, and the common milkweeds. Bright and beautiful brown-eyed Susan or black-eyed Susans, there's two species you can add in there. Great drought plants, see the clear wing a uh, hummingbird moth on the bee balm or wild bergamot. Um, hummingbirds also like this one. It smells great. Add a little bit into your tea if you like herbal teas. Things like the beard tongues, great uh, drought resistant plants. Some of the cone flowers, there's many different species. Um, and this cup plant has the benefit of not only being a great late flowering plant, it's huge though, so if planted up against a wall, but it also collects rainwater in this cup it forms with its leaves around the stem. So the bees and other pollinators can use it like a water source. Some of the green cone flowers, uh, great for pollinators. Again, the later summer flowering plant, quite tall, a couple meters. And then some of the ones that are most overlooked, but probably most important in the late summer as things are laying their eggs and going in to collect all that food for that last dish effort, if you're a monarch, to fly all the way down to Mexico, the golden rods and the asters are absolutely critical at that time of year uh, to set up uh, all these great pollinators to get them through the winter time or to put that energy into those last. Um, some of them are a bit spready, so keep that in mind when you plant them. You might want to have a special bed for the aggressive guys to go together in, um, but they are really critical components. And other great things, some flowering shrubs, like some of the dogwood species, extra benefit to songbirds with the berries, or some of the native viburnum species. Um, again, great flower cluster and different um, lots of different sort of berries there that are wonderful for the birds. Huge, great resources. If you like pollinators, you have landed on something that there's a lot of resources for. The Landowner's Guide to Conserving Native Pollinators is just wonderful. There's special resources for pollinators on farms to help kind of create that in a more working landscape. Um, CVC, the Credit Valley Conservation has some great uh, resources. And if you're wondering what bee it is you found, you can get an app called iNaturalist and put it out to the community of naturalists out there and you'll often get an answer back within a very short amount of time. Um, so I'll end with the magnolia, one of the more ancient flowering plants we have, and just say thank you and open it up to questions and I hope I haven't gone too long. Thank you so much, Shannon. The, the timing is actually quite perfect. Um, for everyone that maintains with us, we would really like to open up the floor to any questions that you may have. Um, if you could just send your questions in through the chat function. Uh, we did have one question a bit earlier on in the session. Um, someone asked, what was the native plant called that you mentioned after brown-eyed Susans? Something like high weed. And then someone, uh, Simone had provided uh, response saying it was Joe Pie Weed. So that was one question. Oh, Joe Pie time. Weed, yes. Mm -hmm. Did anyone else have any? And that other? one. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, you got another oh, question. Oh, nice wetland plant. <laughs> sorry, you were explaining, um, Shannon, and I interrupted. Oh, the Joe Pie Weed, if you have um, moister soils um, or heavy soils like clays and it's a bit moist, just a beautiful plant um, and a little bit like swamp milkweed you can get away with it a little bit into the 
drier side. Um, some things you can do um, if you're in a house garden type of thing is, you know, plant it out where your yeast troughs drain out and kind of create that little microclimate there if you're a drier site. Thank you so much for that reply. Um, we have another question coming from Kathy. Kathy states, you'd like to try and propagate red oyster dogwood by cutting branches and inserting into ground. What is a good time to do that? Um, That's the first part of It's a great way. So live cuttings or live staking. Um, so the willows and the dogwoods are, have evolved to have growth hormone all through their plant body because in the flood in the spring, they often get pinned down and it's a way for those root nodes to grow and expand their patch. Um, but what you can do is before bud out in the spring, if you take them and cut them, make sure you plant them right side up. You can plant them on an angle up to about 45 degrees, but if you plant them upside down, it all goes wrong. So make sure you, you put them in the bucket right side up uh, in a bit of water and then plant them as soon as you can, but they do keep in the bucket as long as things stay cool. And you want to plant about 80% of it so that you're getting lots of those nodes um, underground so that they can go to root and you don't want a top heavy plant that doesn't have a lot of root support but lots of leaves that flush out. Um, so it's a great way to do it. You can now buy rooting hormone, but they used to actually take willow cuttings and things and actually put them in a bucket. And then you soak some of the other plants that don't have great rooting hormone to try to get some of those to reproduce with that. Perfect, thank you. There was also a second part to Kathy's question. Um, she's asking, are there some examples of tall grass prairie that we can visit? example, um, for example, in a park or a conservation authority area? Okay, there's some, there's some lo much larger patches. Our watershed's not great. A lot of it's on private land uh, that's been restored. Uh, there's a little bit out, um, there's definitely remnants around Wasaga Beach Park, more of the Savannah, Oak Savannah side. Uh, but I have noticed things like little blue stem and Indian grass out there. So if you're looking at kind of an oak savanna style, that's probably the best um, site to go to. Things like if you're ever down by Windsor, the Ojibwe Prairie is just gorgeous. Um, out by Rice Lake Plains, there's some amazing examples of larger stem stands. Um, a lot of it's quite hidden. It's funny along rail corridors where you, the old trains uh, used to put sparks out when things were on coal you actually get a fair bit of remnant prairie species growing because as it burned, that helped them outcompete some of the European weeds. So um, sometimes as you walk along rail things, you'll run into patches of uh, prairie species. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, Kay Meadows has asked if we can get a copy of the presentation. Is that available, Shannon? Um, we can do that if you email me, um, or I think we're going to be posting this presentation on the town's website site, and then um, I'll see if I can link it up to the Nauta Saga Valley website as well. So if you want the commentary that goes along with it, uh, that might be a way. So if Elizabeth, I don't know if you can, if you've got uh, her contact, maybe <laughs> send her the link afterwards or send the participants the link. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We can do that from the township side. Oh, sorry, Amy. Oh, that's okay. Um, so we have another question from Laura uh, stating, that was like a TED talk. So wonderful. This year, how long do you have to wait to clean up the yard? This is always a tricky answer. And this is why I'm kind of a fan of having um, a bit of a brush pile somewhere. And if you don't want it to be messy looking, you can build like a little kind of composting house for it or something, uh, but make it open to the ground. You don't want to compress them too much. A lot of the native pollinators only produce a single, single sort of uh, generation a year. And some of them are early hatch outs and some are later. So you probably want a couple weeks where it's been above 10 degrees consistently. So like this flush of 18 that we've had for a week isn't probably enough to get all of those guys that are early hatchers out into the world. 
uh, because we're going to go down into like the minus threes briefly. <laughs> so that will set them back just a little bit. Um, but saying that, like, you can sometimes do a compromise if you leave the first kind of couple of feet of some of the stems, like raspberry stems, and cut a little bit high, then you you can uh, preserve some of that habitat. And again, if you do make a brush pile, those later hatch out guys will will hatch and find their way out there if it's not too compressed. Perfect, thank you. Another question is from D. Cooper. Will you be publishing resources shown at the end? Um, we, we could. Uh, there are web links to them. Hmm. Kind of like the question, can you get a copy? Maybe if you let Emily know that you would like a copy, um, we can, all the hyperlinks are on that last slide. Okay, uh, we have a question from Sandy. The cup plant you showed, has it naturalized and seeded itself in fields? So the cup plant that was on the Martin site that I helped that landowner with um, has, uh, the photo we had was from two years ago. It's spread. I don't know how much is spread and how much is seed, uh, but they kind of make a cluster. So um, if I was finding ones quite far away, then it would be easy to say, but the prairie hasn't been there for long enough for, for me to know for sure. <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. Um, the next question, when do I clean up my garden so I can protect bees, I believe? Uh, similar to the last one, you probably want at least a couple weeks um, of those consistently warmer temperatures to try to get um, those those pollinators, particularly the bees that have gone into winter either as a larva like into its pupate state or as an overwintering adult. Now the overwintering adults are probably going to be faster out, but the ones that have to pupate are probably going to take a lo little longer time. So give them what time you can. Again, if you cut a little high, save your clippings, maybe not for going to composting, <laughs> or at least some of them, then you might be protecting some of those, uh, those things if you can have a little brush pile in an unused part of your lawn. Um, Sherry has asked, what is a good time to replant cedar shrubs? Um, so if you have, this is, is like when the soil starts to thaw out before the buds flush, this is a great time to start moving things around in the garden because the stress is really low. Things are quite cool. Um, you don't have a lot of uh, leaf area that's going to cause evaporation stress. So if you know where your clump is, um, and some people need to wait till it starts to come up a little bit more to make sure that they know what they're digging up or moving around, um, that's this is kind of a nice time. There's another window in the fall um, to plant cedar, usually around end of September, October, as those nights start to really cool down. Um, be mindful though, that if you have a heavy clay soil, planting in the fall is very tricky because you can get a lot of frost heave and the roots haven't had a lot of time to really root that into place yet. Perfect, thank you. Um, Kate says, thanks Shannon for the great presentation. My question, some experts recommend burning off the dead grass in spring from big blue stem or Indian grass, for instance. I wonder whether this would be a bad thing for insects or larva that might be in there. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's interesting to say because tall grass prairies are a fire adapted system. Um, they're warm season or C4 plants that actually work best in the hot and burning off um, some of the nitrogen and blackening the soil kind of creates that habitat. Now what I, and I've been involved with some burns and there's no question that as we are controlling that fire line, uh, the swallows are having an absolute heyday picking off birds at the edge of the fire front. Uh, not picking off insects, not birds. <laughs> that would be well, different levels of the food chain. <laughs> but um, so what, what you want to do is with your site is you probably want to divide it up into pieces so that you don't stress out your pollinator populations all at once. Now, and this is particularly important, partly just because 
it's such a rare habitat type here. Again, if we had mapped the more historically extensive reaches, you could probably quite easily burn that and then it would be recolonized from those other patches. But because we're dealing with tiny amounts of fragmented um, native grasslands, it's probably good to divide it up at least into two and then depending on the scope, maybe more. Thank you. Uh, we have another comment from Susan. I'm planning a small garden that will gradually be expanded. In the first bit of planting, would I be better to focus on one type of pollinator friendly plant? And how would you pick that one if that was the case? Hmm. I actually would try, it all depends on how small it is. Um, so if you're so small, you have to just pick one. It's probably very valuable to have about five of those plants together just to make it a good nectar resource. Um, something that's long flowering, uh, like some of the asters or goldenrods, um, again, they can spread. So uh, you want probably like an aggressive bed garden if that's what you're gonna put in there. Um, if you want some, again, it's tall. So if you've got a sheltered area, you could do cone flowers, um, things like, like the bee bombs, like the bergamot uh, are beautiful pollinator plants. I know I, I intentionally plant some in my vegetable garden and the hum around that is really incredible. Um, it's so hard to say, like ideally you have plants for each season, like spring, summer, and fall. So to pick one, you're almost assuredly missing different seasons. So if you can get a spring, summer, and fall and are big enough to support that, uh, that would be ideal. So something like Columbine in the spring, Bee Balm in the summer, and then maybe uh, maybe one of the cone flowers, like or pr the purple cone flower, if you don't want it too high. Perfect, thank you. Um, a question from D Cooper. I'm looking for an old prickly juniper with no result. Can you suggest where I might find, even dig ourselves? Um, so there's like a creeping juniper um, and like the taller red cedar. Um, if you if you contact um, what town, where are you based? <laughs> um, try the green pages. If you Google MVCA green pages, it's got a ton of native plant nurseries. Pick ones that have trees and shrubs listed. Um, and, and you'll probably get those uh, that have the native junipers there. They're in, they're in Malmer. Okay, so you're actually very close to uh, not so hollow plant nurseries that we use occasionally sometimes on our projects. Um, so not so hollow farms, and they've got a, quite a wide variety of shrubs and trees. Um, again, they're not a most native plant nurseries, they're not a garden center, so call them first um, to do your order over the phone and see what they have. And if they don't have it, they can often bring it in. So. And then I believe we have one final question from Kathy or comment. If you ever get to the Guelph Arboretum, there's a huge- Arboretum. Arboretum. There's a huge stand of some of those tall flowers like the cup plant, it's amazing to see. Thank you for that comment, Kathy. Thank you. And then we have a comment from Susan. Awesome, thank you for the info, just what I was hoping for, which is great. Uh, Duke Cooper also extends their thanks. And Simone says, not so hollow is fantastic. <laughs> Very knowledgeable. Um, that's the one thing around native plant nurseries is that when they have the capacity to do some local genetics, but also, the people that work there um, are very, very knowledgeable. You don't start a native plant nursery by chance, so. Uh, Rosemary says, many great visuals. Thank you, Shannon. Does anyone else um, that's participating this evening have any other comments or questions? Okay, seeing none. Um, it's been a really great discussion, uh, Shannon, and thank you again to everyone that 
took the time out this evening to uh, log in to participate. Um, thank you to um, Madam Mayor Sandy McDonald for um, being with us here tonight. Uh, Kathy extends her thanks a lot as well, exclamation point. Um, so I think it was a really informative, um, well thought out. And, um, oh, someone perhaps has joined online. So um, we have some more comments, people extending thanks for the information. It's amazing to see how much I still have to learn. That's from Sandy um, Kursis. So thanks again so much, everyone, for being able to join us this evening and um, supporting the initiative of the Healthy Community Committee. And again, we extend our thanks to um, Ms. Shannon Stevens from the NBCA. So uh, with that, we'll conclude this uh, evening's uh, session, and we will be in touch um, by sending out the link to where we can access the recording for this evening's webinar. So extending thanks again from staff on behalf of the Township of Essa's Healthy Community Committee. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you so much, Shannon. That was really, really excellent. Um, some really great content. And I think people got quite a bit out of that. So thank you so much for your time and dedication to the Healthy Community Committee. And I'm